going to be talking about some things which, is, which are kind of near and dear to my heart. And, it's the, it, and um, I come from the perspective of a, of a theist. I, I do believe in God. And uh, there is this dominance now in the academy which says that, you know, if you're a real smart person, you can't believe in God. And many of you have probably heard and talked to professors that have said this. And uh, sometimes they're kind of inhibiting. They actually, uh, they actually make you feel kind of small because they're in this sense of power. I want to, I want to share with you, however, the history and the reality of uh, this proposition that science and God are not um, compatible with each other. So could I have the next slide, please? One of the next, one of the problems with science is they always think they're right. And science today thinks, I'm right. You know, whatever I think right now is right. And therefore, they can use that to trump other perspectives. But if you look back in history, you find out that science thought it was right a number of times. And it's, it, was, it was wrong. We've come along. We've changed. Whereas the belief in God has not really changed. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Well, the father of the United States, George Washington, died because he was bled. He was sick and they knew that they had to take out the bad blood and that was the modern science of the time. And history says that's what killed him. So science killed George Washington. And there's other ones. Thomas Watson, the chairman of IBM in 1943 said, I think uh, there is a world market for maybe five computers. Totally wrong. Ernest Rutherford is credited with splitting the atom for the first time, and he won the Nobel Prize in 1908 for chemistry, and he says, the energy produced by breaking down the atom is a very poor kind of thing. Anyone who expects a source of power from the transformation of these atoms is talking moonshine. In other words, no atomic energy, no uh, good use for, um, for splitting the atom. And Robert Millikan, who was an American physicist and won the Nobel Prize in 23, 1923, said there is no likelihood a man can ever tap the power of the atom. And there's a bunch of other ones. The, 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 the king of these is Lord Kelvin, who was president of the Royal Society in England, who is famous for three quotes. He said, radio has no future, 1897. X-rays will prove to be a hoax. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. So science, we see, has, has often, uh, often been wrong. So they, they are in no way to, uh, uh, to make a claim on their universal truth. Uh, next slide. Next slide. I got to remember to change the slides here. Uh, despite this, there is a new movement called the New Atheists, which are uh, trying to purport that uh, atheism is the only way and that science has trumped God in some way. We have Richard Dawkins on the left that said biblical miracles are effective with an audience of unsophisticates and children. Uh, next to him is uh, Christopher Hitchens who recently passed away from cancer. He said, I think religion is a deadly threat to the survival of the species and to be and, and to the continued evolution of the brain. Eh, okay. And then there's Sam Harris on the right. He says, the fact that 40% of American scientists believe in God indicates that 60% of the scientists aren't doing their job. These new atheists are very, very outspoken in their beliefs. And I have a, I have a clip. Next slide, please. This next one is from uh, Peter Atkins. He's a professor of chemistry at the University of Oxford. He's a fellow of the Lincoln College, and he's written some popular chemistry texts. Uh, could we play the clip then? I hope you can hear it. Religion. I mean, it's just fantasy, basically. It's completely empty of any explanatory content. And it's evil as well. <laughs> I think it, it's interesting. You know, it's evil as well, and then he gives an evil laugh. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but the interesting thing is, is people like Atkins don't look at their own, own philosophy. I don't think that an, that an atheist gets to answer or, or identify anything as evil. Because if you are an atheist, there's no reason for good or bad. Everything is just survival of the fittest. There is no good and bad. So that's okay if another theist asks another theist about 
something being evil or not, because they have a foundation for that evil, but Atkins doesn't. Let's go on to Richard Dawkins, who is next. He's a zoologist, an evolutionary biologist. He's a professor emeritus uh, of the New College at Oxford and is the University of Oxford's professor of understanding of science. And if we could go to the next clip, uh, we'll hear Richard Dawkins' explanation of the God of Abraham. Next slide, please, and go ahead and play this. And it was then when I discovered evolution, when I discovered Darwinism, that I realized there's this magnificently elegant, stunningly elegant explanation, um, which I didn't quite understand to begin with. When I did understand it, then that finally killed off my remaining religious faith. I think that God is about as unlikely as fairies, angels, uh, hobgoblins, etc. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Who? Isn't that a downer? Frank Turek, who is an apologist, uh, said of um, Richard Dawkins that his philosophy can be boiled down to two statements. Number one, there is not a God, and number two, I hate him. <laughs> P.C. Myers is also one of the members of the so-called New Atheist. Uh, he once called me disillusioned on his blog, and I wear that as a badge of honor. Uh, and in the next clip, he talks about his view of religion. I, I never hated religion. I found religion quite comfortable, and I liked the people in it. Uh, what led to the atheism was learning more about science, learning more about the natural world, and seeing these horrible conflicts with religion. And if you separate out the ethical message from religion, what have you got left? You got, you got a bunch of fairy tales, right? Greater science literacy, which is going to lead to the erosion of religion. And then we'll get this nice positive feedback mechanism going, where as religion slowly fades away, we get more and more science to replace it. And that will displace more and more religion, which will allow more and more science in. And we'll eventually get to that point where religion has taken that appropriate place as, as you know, side dish rather than the main course. Boy, it got quiet. That's pretty, uh, pretty rough stuff. One of the things that I do appreciate is the few atheists that you talk to that actually admit to the consequences of their belief. In other words, if you don't believe in a God, you cannot talk about evil. If there is no God, how can you say something is bad or good? You can't. You have no, you, you have no foundation on which to uh, make your voice. There are some exceptions to this, some atheists that have done it. Friedrich Nietzsche was one of them. Another one is a man that recently passed away, William Provine, and he's a distinguished uh, university uh, professor at Cornell University. He's a professor in the departments of history, science and technology studies, and ecology and evolutionary uh, biology. Let's listen to him and see what he says. Oh, I was a Christian, but I never heard anything about evolution because it was illegal to teach it in Tennessee. I could find no sign of there being any design whatsoever in evolution. And I immediately began to doubt the existence of a deity. It starts by giving up an active deity. Then it gives up the hope that there's any life after death. When you give those two up, the rest of it follows fairly easily. And you give up the hope that there's a, an imminent morality. And finally, there's no human free will. If you believe in evolution, you can't hope for there being any free will. There's no hope whatsoever of there being any deep meaning in human life. We live, we die, and we're gone. We're absolutely gone. Wow. Now, one of the things that uh, Provine 
makes a mistake on is one's view on evolution has something to do with your view on God. I think that's a big assumption, maybe something that he was, he was talked about. Uh, he said science caused him to lose his uh, faith, and as a consequence of losing his faith, there was no free will, no hope, an honest atheist uh, is who will provide us. Now, wh wh one of the interesting things, he says, notice that once I accepted that there was a scientific problem, everything else was easy. Uh, it reminds me of the movie Ratatouille. Have any of you seen that movie? Where the, 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 this mouse comes up, this big fat mouse, he's eating something. He, uh, the little mouse says, what are you eating? He says, well, I don't know. And he keeps on eating it. He says, how could you do that? He says, well, once you get past the gag reflex, it's not so bad. <laughs> so I think that uh, Provine got past the uh, gag reflex. Well, what, what does the... Um, what, what is the reality of this? Let's look at uh, the, next, uh, the next slide, which is a, it's a capture from uh, Ecclesiastes. It says, what has been will be done again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. One of the propositions that I want to give you and actually make the case for is that atheism has always been a part of the world throughout history. And therefore, nothing has really changed. It's just that now we have uh, a lot louder uh, talkers. One of my colleagues at Baylor is Rodney Stark. Next slide. And um, he writes the following. The false head that science required the defeat of religion as proclaimed by such self-appointed cheerleaders as Voltaire, Diderot, and Gibbon, who themselves played no part in the scientific enterprise, a pattern that continues. This is a really ouch because what Stark is saying is that all of these new atheists that are coming out really haven't done anything of substance in science, that they are mostly known for being loudmouths against faith. And uh, so that was a little, a little uh, bang. If uh, you want to read a good read, The Glory of God by Rodney Stark is a book that I would certainly recommend. Okay, the next topic I want to have, a uh, next slide please, is how does the new atheism position about science versus faith stand up to history? Now, many of you are nerds like me, you know, you're in a STEM sort of uh, curriculum, uh, and many of you are not. Even if you're not, you might have heard of some of the names that I'm going to give you. We hear and we study all the time in engineering and science and mathematics the names of uh, people and the things that they did, but we re very rarely look at who they are. What was it that motivated them? It turned out that, next slide, if you will, that the, the Christian worldview undeniably has given rise to science. Why is this? It is because the scientists recognized, uh, this, was, this was in Eastern Europe, that there was God who was a lawgiver he gave laws in the, old, in, in the Abrahamic uh, uh, texts, and we have the Ten Commandments, and they thought, you know, if, if, if God makes moral laws, maybe he makes physical laws too. There must be some sort of order in the universe, some sort of law, and this was a great motivator of the rise of science. Next slide. Here's another quote, the Hebrew and Christian belief in a deity who was once a creator and lawgiver rendered the idea of laws of, natural, of nature valid. Now this is not to say good things only happened in Eastern Europe. We know that lots of good mathematics happened in China. Uh, one, of the, one of the areas that I've used is something called the, um, the Chinese remainder theorem in mathematics which is really cool. We can talk about that some other time. Uh, and we know that the Arab world also gave a lot of mathematical insight as opposed to cosmological insight. Uh, the column argument for the existence of God is an is a Arabic Muslim uh, idea. But we borrowed today things from the Arab world. We know about Arabic numerals, right? One, two, three, four, five. The word algorithm is from uh, Arabic uh, and it's named after this guy whose name I can't pronounce, so we'll just call him Algebra. And so that's where that, I mean, no, we'll call, him al we'll call him Algorithm. And also Algebra is uh, Arabic for reunion of broken parts. So you can see that there were good things that were happening there also. <clears throat> One of the things that, 
we see in the scientists is different perspectives as they examine the science. We saw, for example, these great scientists saying there is no God, yet there were other people. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Such as uh, Louis Pasteur, and I think everybody here is familiar with Louis Pasteur. When he looked at science and the creation, he said, the more I study nature, the more I stand amazed at the work of the creator. Into his tiniest creatures, God has placed extraordinary properties. If we look at the next slide, we see that this is biography's top 100 persons of the millennium. They published this in the year 2000, and these are the most important people, supposedly, that lived uh, in the previous thousand years. You'll notice number two is Isaac Newton, and he, of course, founded physics, and he was the co-discoverer of calculus. And when you go get an undergraduate in STEM research today, you take physics and you take calculus and you spend your time studying the things that, uh, the things that Newton created and discovered. Uh, another one is Pasteur. We've talked about Blaise Pascal. Is, he's been dead for 300 years, but he's still a good friend of mine, as we'll talk about. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell, uh, Michael Faraday, uh, Thomas Bayes. Let's look at uh, Sir Isaac Newton and his, first of all, his accomplishments. These are the things we know, but we don't really talk about who he was. He's one of the greatest names in the history of human thought, and uh, before he came along, he was the foundation, still is the foundation of physics. Since then, they've added relativity on one side, they've added quantum mechanics on the other side, and now down here is the theory of everything, the string theory, which is trying to unify everything. But still, it is so foundational that this is the topic of physics one and physics two, if you take them at the, uh, in the university. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> His celebrity is celebrated here with a bunch of different stamps from Great Britain, Poland, France, the former Soviet Union, Germany, and the Congo. Next slide. His, one of his most famous things was uh, creating calculus. And he did this in parallel with Leibniz and he also has another number of things named after him. Here's a list of, the, list of some of the different things. <coughs> One of the most uh, common is Newton's laws, which every physicist learns about. Next slide. You can see that uh, from this quote that uh, Newton really agreed with, with um, Pasteur. He said, the beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. He was indeed a theist. Uh, next slide. This was an introduction to his book called Optics, and Optics, believe it or not, is still in print. You can probably go to Amazon.com and order a copy of this book, but in the preface he says, God in the beginning formed matter in solid, massy, hard, impenetrable, movable particles of such sizes and figures and with other such properties and in such proportion to space as most conduced him to the end for which he formed them. This version, could somebody give me the water here? Him the water. I just took a zinc tablet. You ever take those zinc tablets and make your throat feel funny? Nobody's taking zinc tablets. So. Okay. Um, anyway, this is actually a paraphrase of Revolution, Re Revolution, <laughs> Revelation 411, where it says, Thou art worthy, O God, to see royal uh, glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So Newton actually took some, some holy scripture and translated it there. Now, how did Newton feel about atheism? Next slide. He wasn't too happy about it. He said atheism is so senseless and odious to mankind that it never had many professors. I think it's very curious that he used the word professors here, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, so he was not a big fan of atheism. Another uh, theist was uh, Jonas Kepler. Next slide. Kepler was incredible because he just stood and he watched stars go by and he came up with these wonderful mathematical relationships for the way that the planets moved. Next slide. Yeah, there he is. There's Kepler. Looks like a stern guy, doesn't he? <clears throat> and anyway, he came up with all of this just by observing the uh, stars. Next slide. <clears throat> Kepler was asked, uh, why do you study science? He answered that he desired his scientific research to obtain a sample test 
of the de delight of the divine creator in his work and to partake of his joy. So here was another guy that was not, indeed, not a, uh, an atheist. Next one is the father of my field. Next slide, Michael Faraday. Now, Michael Faraday was incredible. He was the greatest experimentalist of the 19th century. And if you have a motor or you use electricity, you have Faraday to thank because he actually discovered Faraday's law, which allows the transformation of motion into electricity and electricity back into motion. One is a generator, the other is a machine. And he did such incredible things. He founded biochemistry. He was the first one to isolate benzene, believe it or not. Um, it is, uh, he coined the terms, and you've probably heard of this, uh, farad. Any nerd know what farad is? It's a unit of capacitance, right? Uh, electrode, anode, cathode, and electronic. So you've heard of the word electronic. Faraday was the first to coin those words. Faraday actually belonged to a church and where he actually preached about every other month. And uh, that's very interesting. So again, we know who this guy was, but what did he do? Um, let's go ahead and skip to the next slide because we'll get back to Faraday in a little bit. Uh, another great guy was George Washington Carver. And uh, George Washington Carver was a, um, a black American who did research in the lagoon, the peanut. And he just was, he was just a powerhouse. He had the guts to name his, his research lab God's Little Workshop, and he was brought up to the Capitol and uh, he, he talked to Congress and things. But here's what he did out of the peanut, you ready? He created adhesives, axle grease, bleach, butter, chili sauce, fuel briquettes, ink, instant coffee. Coffee out of peanuts? Hmm. Uh, linoleum, mayonnaise, meat tenderizer, metal polish, paper, plastic, pavement, shaving cream, shoe polish, synthetic rubber, talcum powder, and wood stain. So the guy did a lot. And uh, we'll revisit him uh, again. We're getting more into the modern era. Uh, the next slide, please, is Donald Knuth. If anybody studies computer science or computer engineering, they've heard of Donald Knuth. He is the modern... He is the modern... Uh, um, generator of computer science and, um, and computer engineering. He has these great volumes called The Art of Computer Programming, which have, I looked it up on Google Scholar, and he has tens of thousands of references. So tens of thousands of people have references work. It's really, really incredible. One of the things that Knuth did, I thought this was really interesting, uh, he teaches computer programming. Next slide. And when you teach uh, computer programming, if you grade computer programming, you can't grade the whole computer program, can you? It's just too long. So he would pick a few places and he would, uh, he would uh, identify whether the student had done the right programming at the time. And so he thought, you know, this would be a great way to read the Bible. So he started with something called the 316 Project, where he decided that he would go through the Old Testament, the New Testament, and every chapter he would read the uh, third chapter and the 16th verse. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of great uh, elements in there. So he, he did something called the 316 Project, and I thought it's neat. Only a nerd would uh, decide to read something <laughs> by sampling, of it, sampling it of that, in that way. The next one is Thomas Bayes. This goes back, so back a little bit. Uh, you, some of you might have heard of Bayes' theorem. If you've ever had a course in probability or statistics, you've heard of Bayes. Bayes impacts you today because of your spam filters. Spam filters on your email use Bayesian, uh, Bayesian logic, Bayesian uh, inference. And they decide whether or not your email that you've received is spam or not. So the guy's impact was really incredible. The interesting thing about this is that Bayes never published anything in his lifetime. Everything that he published was uh, after he passed away because his full-time job was a Presbyterian minister. He was a uh, pastor of the Presbyterian Church in Tunbridge Wells. It was 30 miles southeast of London. And he did publish a lot about his faith. He said, uh, God always does what is right and fit, and that all his moral attributes, namely justice, truth, faithfulness, mercy, patience, etc., are but so many different modifications of rectitude. 
So he was very open about uh, making sure everybody knew he was a theist. And then we get to James Clerk Maxwell. I'm rolling by these uh, relatively quickly. Maxwell was incredible. He was maybe the greatest theoretician of the 19th century. And he came up with a bunch of stuff, one of which he did the first color photograph, and you can see him here. He's holding next, yeah, that one. He's holding actually a color wheel that allows him to make color photographs way back in the middle of the uh, 19th century. But the thing he's most known for, if you've had courses in physics or um, electromechanics, you've seen these before. These are Maxwell's equations. These are four equations he came up with, which scientists spend their entire lives still studying today. There's two professors in my department who still study Maxwell's equations and the ramifications of them. They are just incredible in these four little equations. There's so much cool stuff there. Uh, and <laughs> if you read text, they actually deify Maxwell's equations. Here was J.P. Pierce, he said, to anyone who is motivated by anything beyond the most narrowly practical, it is worthwhile to understand Maxwell's equations simply for the good of their soul. Ludwig Boltzmann, who was a Nobel Prize winner, really famous physicist, said, was it a god that wrote these words? And uh, in, when I was a boy, I took a, I, I took a course in, by, in, in a text called Holiday and Resnick, and it says, the formulation of Maxwell's equations is the most important event since Newton's time. That's a quote, by the way, from Albert Einstein. Uh, Maxwell's equations can be appreciated, and here's the quote from my text, Maxwell's equations can be appreciated by those who understand them on an aesthetic level. They are, they are incredible, the impact. Next slide. Maxwell was a theist also. He said, I believe that man's chief is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And the only desire which I can have is, like David, to serve my own generation by the will of God and then fall asleep. So certainly, science was not something that took faith from Maxwell. Next slide. And then there is my good friend, Blaise Pascal. He passed away when he was nine, uh, 39 years old. So he died a very young man. But boy, what he did. If you study physics, you know that Pascal is a measure of pressure in the metric unit, metric system. Uh, there is Pascal's law, which has to do with pressure. Uh, and there's Pascal's triangle also. Sometimes Pascal's triangle, I remember being taught Pascal's triangle in uh, elementary school. And this was something that he came up with. Next slide. He did great mathematicians. Here's a theorem he did when he was, I think, 14 years old. If you want me to go through it, talk to me afterwards. <laughs> okay. Here's the next slide. This is uh, Pascal's triangle, which is a table of binomial coefficients, which is really cool if you like this sort of thing. Pascal also founded probability. You know, when we hear, like, the probability, uh, the probability of rain tomorrow is going to be... 50%. Where did that idea of probability came through, came, come from? It turns out prior to, prior to Pascal, the idea of predicting something about the future was totally, you know, it just, it just doesn't exist. So with a, the work and correspondence with another great mathematician, Fermat, he was able to develop the entire field of probability as we know it today. So this was Pascal. Next slide. He was also the inventor of the first computer. This is the Pascaline calculator. His father was a, was a tax collector, and he, he invented this to help his dad. And uh, so that's the reason that there is a computer programming language known as Pascal because of his playing around with uh, computers. And then the next one is Leonard Euler. Woo, what a guy. You said that Brian, Brian said that I had over 300 publications, and yes, some of them are good. Uh, Euler had 299, 229 publications. Now that's pretty good, but here's the thing. They were published after he died. This guy was so prolific. He's probably the greatest mathematician of all time, and he did just wonderful and, and, and great things. And next slide. Here are some things which are named after Euler. He, he, at the end of his life, <laughs> this, is, this is a good nerd story. He went blind in one eye, and he says, oh, I rejoice to God I'm going blind in one eye because it will distract me less. I'll have less distraction from the world uh, to distract me from my mathematics. 
But then he prayed too deeply and he went blind to the other eye. So uh, he was in St. Saint... <clears throat> Petersburg and he surrounded himself with a bunch of scholars at the time and these scholars would sit down and they would dictate to Pascal and that's the reason he could have 229 papers after he died because these had been dictated to his people yet they have not written them down yet. Here's some things, next slide. These are some things which are named after Euler. Um, one of them, if you've had any calculators, you, you know E, you know E, uh, 2.7, uh, that was actually the number invented by Euler. The E, some say, is named after Euler, E to the X. Um, but Euler did not name it after himself. He just called it the exponential function. So here are some things which are named after Euler. He dabbled in everything. Next slide. Here's some more things named after Euler. And the ones that are in blue, you can look up on Wikipedia so you can actually get a deeper understanding. Pretty impressive, huh? Next slide. Here's more things named after Euler. Next slide. More stuff named after Euler. This guy was incredible, and his insight was amazing. Okay, next slide. Ooh, more stuff named after Euler. So he did an incredible amount of work. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, Euler was a theist. He says, for, for since the very fabric of the universe is most perfect in the work of a most wise creator, nothing at all takes the place in the universe in which some rule of maximum or minimum does not appear. It's not the context of this I want to point to. It's just the fact that, yeah, he does believe in a creator. He does believe in a God. Now, remember the atheists that we started out with? We shouldn't think that all of the scientists back then also, okay, 15 minutes, I get. Okay, all of the scientists were motivated by God. They weren't. One of them was Laplace. And if you're in engineering or math, you've taken Laplace transforms uh, uh, to, to solve different things. And next slide. And uh, Laplace was an atheist. Next slide. He said, uh, Napoleon asked Laplace why God, and he worked for Napoleon. He was around that time. He wrote a uh, treatise on celestial mechanics, and, and Napoleon asked him, where is your, where is God in this? And his answer was, I need no use of God. There's no need for God that I have. So he was kind of an Atkins or a Dawkins of his time. And this is, this is persistent. One of the things that I wanted to talk about, and this is a little bit out of the scope of some of the things going on here, is I am a Christian. And we have talked now to this point about theism. I want to talk about my particular faith, which is Christianity, and what some of these people have to say. Next slide. Well, here it is. Yeah, man is, this is the definition of Christian, because you say the word Christian today could be a bunch of things. Uh, man has fallen and is a sinful redemption is only possible through the appeal to the sacrifice of God's son, Jesus Christ, and following him as your Lord. Uh, what were the, that's my definition of Christianity that I'm going to be using henceforth. What were the belief of these theist scientists in uh, Christianity? Next slide. George Washington Carver. He said, Jesus said, one must be born again, must become as a little child. You must let no laziness, no fear, no stubbornness keep you from your duty. So he was not only a theist, he was a Christian. Donald Knuth, next slide, wrote a book called Things uh, a Computer Scientist Basically Never Talks About. And in it, he talked about his faith. And he is also, he's a Lutheran, he's a, he's a Christian. Newton actually spent most of his life writing interpretation of Old Testament um, prophecy. And if you go to the bluebible.com, you can actually read his works. And in fact, he spent more time writing about, writing about, uh, uh, writing about prophecy than he did working in physics, believe it or not. And you can see here, there is one God, the ever Father everlasting, omnipresent, omniscient, almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Uh, Kepler, next slide, said, I believe only in the service of Jesus Christ. In him is all refuge and solace. Next slide, my hero, Michael Faraday. Though the, th though the thought of death brings the thought of judgment, it also brings to the Christian thoughts of Jesus Christ who died. What is cool is by the time he died, if they'd been giving Nobel Prizes back in the 19th century, Faraday would have won about 
five or six of them. I, he, he was just that, that incredible of a researcher. And when he, went out, when he was on his deathbed, he was, uh, he was um, approached by a number of reporters who asked him, when you die, what are your speculations? And when he, went as, when he was on his deathbed, he said, speculations, I know nothing about speculations. I'm, I'm resting on certainties. I know my Redeemer liveth. Okay, let's, let's skip this slide because of time. It's another quote by Michael Faraday. Uh, also, James Clerk Maxwell was, it turns out to be a Presbyterian, and here's a quote, think what God has determined to do to all of those who submit themselves to his righteousness and are willing to receive his gift of eternal life in Christ. They are to be uh, conformed to the image of his son, and when that is fulfilled and God sees they are conformed to the image of Christ, there can be no condemnation. Next, Leonard Euler was an outspoken critic of the atheists of his day. Remember, things are not changing. And he had a bunch of back and forth with people that claimed there was no God. And he said, the divinity of Christ's mission in this world cannot be denied. It is an established truth that he has risen from the dead, and we can absolutely trust in all the promises given in the gospel. Penzais is a, is a uh, next slide, is a... Uh, is a um, work done by Blaise Pascal. Blaise Pascal had an incredible incident in his life. Next page. Let's, uh, let's go to the next page then, too. When Pascal died, he was on his funeral slab, and they were cutting away his clothes. And they cut away the lining of his jacket and they found sewn in the lining of his jacket some documents that he had written. And they took them out, and they looked at them, and it was, it, it was uh, Pascal's statement of when he f believed in God. He believed in it in a specific night. Historians call it the uh, night of fire because of what Pascal went to. We know when it happened. It happened on Monday, November 23rd, 1654. He said, certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, 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 tears of joy. Let me not be separated from him eternally. This was an incredible uh, transformation for Pascal. Something that he felt so important about that he wrote it down and kept it next to his heart his entire life. Next slide. Uh, I had a similar experience when I decided that God exists, and I did mention that I'm a Christian, and here's where it happened. This is my house in Garfield Heights, 1970, that little room at the top, and I just decided there must be a God. I knew that I had problems in my life, and I knew that only a God could uh, rectify it. Next slide. What about today? Well, contrary to popular myth, this is an MIT study, contrary to popular myth, scientists appear to have the same range of attitudes about religious matters as does the general public. That's Alan Lightman. So it says the percentage of people who uh, are theists really haven't diminished over history that much. Now, let's replay some of those uh, earlier clips in my final few minutes. If we go to the next session. Remember this religion. Guy? I mean, it's just fantasy, basically. It's completely empty of any explanatory content. And it's evil as well. <laughs> uh, here's the thing. Put these, put, put these claims to the test. Put them against people that know what they're talking about. Here is a debate between, uh, at the end of a debate between uh, Richard Atkins and William Lane Craig, who Atkins made the same sort of comment and listened to, uh, and listened to Craig's response. <laughs> but but, okay. but oh, do you deny that science cannot account for everything? Yes, I do deny that science So what can't it account for? Well, I, had you brought that up in the debate, I had a number of examples that I was going to give. Uh, I think we there stop are a good it for a of things that cannot be scientifically proven, but that were all rational. Do you hear what the question was? Atkins said, do you deny that there are things which are true that cannot be proven by science? Craig's response was, well, yes, I can. I, I have five of them I can list right now. 
And this is his response. And then I noticed that for non-American students there's sometimes colloquialism problems. I had, a, I had a student from Korea said, that is not a piece of cake. When I said something was a piece of cake, it was a, it's a colloquialism. There's a statement in here with William Lane Craig, well, I'm sorry, William F. Buckley, uh, after Craig's response says, well, stick that in your pipe and smoke it. That's a derogatory term saying that, boy, you have been had. So can we go back and replay that again? <laughs> but, with, oh, but, the, but, but oh, do you deny that science cannot account for everything? Yes, I do deny that science So what can can't it account for? Well, I, had you brought that up in the debate, I had a number of examples that I was going to give. Uh, I think there are a good number of things that cannot be scientifically proven, but that we're all rational to accept. Let, so, me, list, let me list five. Logical and mathematical truths cannot be proven by science. Science presupposes logic and math, so that to try to prove them by science would be arguing in a circle. Uh, metaphysical truths, like there are other minds other than my own, or that the external world is real, or that the past was not created five minutes ago with an appearance of age, are rational beliefs that cannot be scientifically proven. Ethical beliefs about statements of value uh, are not accessible by the scientific method. You can't show by science whether the Nazi scientists in the camps did anything evil as opposed to the scientists in Western democracies. Aesthetic judgments, number four, cannot be accessed by the scientific method because the beautiful, like the good, cannot be scientifically proven. And finally, most remarkably, would be science itself. Science cannot be justified by the scientific method. Science is permeated with uh, unprovable assumptions. For example, in the special theory of relativity, the whole theory hinges on the assumption that the speed of light is constant in a one-way direction between any two points A and B. But that strictly cannot be proven. We simply have to assume that in order to hold to the theory. But you're missing the whole so put you, that in your pipe and smoke it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So okay. We are, uh, none of these beliefs can be scientifically proven, and yet they are accepted by all of us. So here's the point. When you hear atheists come out and say these little monologues against theism and belief in God, they need to be challenged by somebody that knows what they're talking about. There needs to be the debate and the dialogue, and invariably the atheist, in my experience, loses. Uh, you notice the use of logic here by Craig. There is the idea that only things proven by science are true. Can you prove that statement by science? No, you can't. It's a self-refuting, uh, it's, it's self-refuting. And an introductory philosophy, you say if you have, an introdu if you have a self-refuting statement, it is wrong. So uh, again, that's the takeaway that I, w I would like to have here. Uh, here's another guy. This is John Lennox. Uh, again, I'm coming from this from the point of myself being a Christian. He's a professor of mathematics at Oxford. He's a fellow in mathematics and philosophy of science at Green Templeton College in Oxford University. If you want a good interchange between him and um, Richard Dawkins, go to the internet. It has a really great debate. Here is his explanation about his belief in God. The reason you believe in consciousness and energy, even though you cannot understand very much about what they actually are, is because of their explanatory power. They make sense of various things that you observe, and I said it's exactly the same of course at a deeper or perhaps a higher level with my faith that Jesus is both God and man. It's the only solution that makes sense. That he is a man is not difficult, of course, but it's that he is both God and man. And I believe that that makes sense of the evidence, evidence of his life, the uniqueness of his claim which he backed up by showing that he possessed the attributes of God. And above all, I suppose the central thing that I find convincing is the fact that he rose from the dead. He's broken the death barrier. 
The, um, the last one I want to share with you is probably the most politically powerful scientist in the world, who is Francis Collins. Uh, Francis Collins is known for heading the project in the United States that mapped human DNA for the first time. Currently, he is the head of the National Institutes of Health. That's the biggest funding organization for medical and biomedical research. They have, they, it has budgets of millions and millions of dollars. He also is a founder of BioLogos. And in here, he shares his confrontation with God. Did you have, at some point, a born-again experience? When people talked to me about born again, I didn't know what they were really referring to when I was growing up. But yes, I did have a moment where I became a believer. I had struggled for two years with this debate within myself, gradually coming to the conclusion that belief in God was the most plausible of the choices, but that it couldn't be proved. And after many months of struggling with whether to make that leap uh, on a beautiful fall day hiking in the northwest with my mind a little more clear than usual because there were not the usual distractions I felt I could no longer resist and I became a believer that day uh, in the sunshine and the shadow of the Cascade Mountains so here are the here are the takeaways that I want you to have um, this will conclude the, the slideshow science and faith are not mutually exclusive in fact one illuminates the other one. And you will find out that the percentage of people of faith that do believe in God is basically uncorrelated with intellect. It's really amazing. We have the people such as Hitchens, obviously a brilliant man, Dawkins, who's a brilliant man, who say, no, there is no God. We also have people such as uh, Collins and... Uh, before him, John Lennox, an Oxford mathematician, saying there is a God. These are people of giant intellects, yet their belief in God is very different. So, so faith in God is not something which is, uh, which is correlated with, index, with, um, with intellect. The battle is not uh, one of science versus religion. It is rather one of uh, faith versus non-faith. It is ideological in that sense. And also, another takeaway is there is nothing new under the sun. The battle that we see today between the theists and the atheists are the same battle that we have seen for eons. Laplace was the atheist back, in the, uh, back uh, under a Napoleon, and then you had great theists such as Pascal and others. Um, there is nothing new under the sun. Atheists have been dissing Christianity throughout history. As far as, uh, as far as faith being correlated with intellect, I think that we all know people that aren't very bright that do believe in God, and we also know that people that are not very bright don't believe in God. So there is no correlation between the two, which I think is a very important takeaway from this. So if you ever hear a professor or anybody else say that science has disproven God or that science is uh, in some way replaced God, challenge them because they are not talking from scientific fact. They are talking from an ideological perspective and they are actually defending their way of life and not necessarily anything to do with, uh, with, uh, with faith in God or in my case, Christianity. That concludes my talk, and thank you for your, thank you for your attention. Do we want to have questions? Anybody got a question? Yes. Oh yeah, I think all of mathematics. The question was, uh, what were some of those things that cannot be proven um, by science? There's the entire idea. This is a very interesting question. Did the number three exist before creation? What do you think? 
did the number three, if you believe that God created the world, did the number three exist before that happened? I think it's, it's kind of a cool answer, a, a cool question. And the answer is, I don't think it can be uh, answered. Let me, uh, let me go back and, and tell you some of the things that Craig said. He said, logical and mathematical proofs cannot be proven to be science. Science presupposes logic and math, so proving them by science would be arguing in a circle. Um, ethical beliefs. There is no way that you can scientifically prove that the Nazis at Auschwitz were bad if you don't believe in a God and have a moral foundation. There's no way that science can prove that can prove it was bad. Um, science itself, and I mention this as a self-refuting statement that if you say the only truth is the truth that you have through science, well, that's a statement that cannot be proven by science, so therefore it must be untrue. That's kind of weird, right? <laughs> so it's a circular sort of uh, way of reasoning. Um, and then metaphysical uh, truth, there, mu there are other minds. I mean, how do, uh, how do I prove that you're there and I'm here? Can you prove that scientifically? You can do experiments, but eh, you know. How, how can you prove that the experience that you have right now was not programmed into your mind 20 seconds ago? You can't prove that scientifically. Rather, this is something that, uh, that we accept above and beyond science. And you're right, I do think that a lot of mathematics, including imaginary numbers and complex numbers, are uh, things which can't be proven scientifically. And then you get to an interesting question of whether mathematics is discovered or invented. And that, that's another story for another time. But uh, yeah, these, these are just, the, these are fascinating observations which, which demonstrate that indeed science doesn't explain everything. <laughs>